It's Big Score Day in Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and we have a ridiculous amount of super spicy mythics to talk about, including maybe the cutest magic card that has ever been made, a new lotus, and a ton more, which means we should probably break it down. Hey, hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Safrada Live, and it's time for another daily dose of Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoilers. So today is a weird day. Today our main focus is on the big score. So if you don't know the big score, the big score was supposed to be March of the Machines Aftermath, but for Outlaws of Thunder Junction, but then everyone freaked out rightly about Aftermath. So Wizards pulled the plug on Aftermath and instead decided to just add 30 mythics from that set into the main Outlaws of Thunder Junction set. You'll get them in the list slot, so like one in every five packs will have one of these. Every single one of the 30 cards in the big score set is going to be a mythic. Uh, originally, I don't think they were all mythics. They were from uncommons up to mythics. So if you see a bunch of mythic rarity symbols, it doesn't necessarily mean the card should be mythic. It just means, I don't know, Wizards want to get some wild cards out of Magic Arena players, I guess. So he just to put them all at mythic i should also say all these cards are standard legal so it's not like uh, the breaking news bonus sheet or something all these cards standard legal essentially just part of the set but they have a different set code and we have a super huge amount of really exciting cards to talk about which means we should probably jump right into it because this video might be a little bit long before we do a couple of quick reminders First, if you need any of these cards, you can pre-order them from our sponsored Card Kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should mosey on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk Outlaws of Thunder Junction and the Big Score. So first up in Big Scoreville, we have Loot the Key to Everything, which is... Definitely one of the cutest magic cards Wizards has ever made, and probably going to be one of the most divisive. It's kind of funny to see how mixed people's opinions are of this card. Some people just love it because it's super cute, and other people are like, Ha, ah, this is Hasbro that is making Wizards make a cute character that looks like a Yu Gi Oh card or something. It's like Magic's Pikachu, so then they can make plushies and try to save their toy business, which is failing. Which I wouldn't put that past Hasbro, but the whole loot conspiracy theory, a little bit too tinfoil hat, even for me uh, as far as the lore of this card and i will warn you i am not the best lore person but my understanding of the story is they finally get in the vault and they find loot in the vault ah oh, very good wizards his name is loot yeah you see what they did there but they find loot in the vault and loot apparently has like a map of the multiverse in its brain so jason rosker like hey we can take advantage of this little guy you're gonna come with us and help us do something but we don't really know what yet so that's my understanding of where we're at with loot in the story if i'm wrong correct me in the comments i'm not a lore person so i'm gonna stick to the magic implications of this card and i will say purely from a gameplay perspective I kind of hate this card because it's just like a super generic good stuff card. So it's a three mana teamer one, two. It's a peace noble. It's a legendary creature. It has ward one. It says the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library where X is the number of card types among non-land permanents you control. And you may play those cards this turn. So essentially loot says play things and I'll draw you a bunch of cards so you can play more things and then I'll draw you even more cards. But it's just kind of like put good permanence in your deck. That's all loot really asks of you. It doesn't push you in any particular direction. You can jam pretty much anything you want in this deck. Obviously, more permanence and more diversity among permanent types is going to be a good thing, but really, there's not much of an ask from loot. I will say I find it kind of hilarious that... <laughs> All the outlaws in the multiverse join together for this huge storyline and try to like pull off the big score and everyone joins up and then they end up with this little gremlin thing rather than a big pile of treasure. Kind of like I had to hang out with Rakdos, you know, for like months and he's kind of a jerk and all I got out of it was loot and not even the good loot. I think as far as actually playing this card, it does come down early. If you have a mana dork, it comes down on turn two and it'll start generating card advantage each turn. And then as I said, as far as building around it, the thing I don't like about this card is it's just like super generic good stuff card how do you build a commander deck around loot 
You like play artifacts like Soul Ring that are probably going to be in your deck anyway. You play some creatures like maybe an Eternal Witness or Mana Dork that you probably were going to play anyway. Maybe you play an enchantment like Ristic Study or a Planeswalker like Oko. The only thing that's kind of like a stretch is maybe loot gets you to put some battles in your deck because that's a unique permanent type that'll draw you more cards. I guess the same is true of like tribal cards like Bitter Blossom, anything with the tribal type or I think it's the Kindred type now. But whatever is on that type, but like that's the only thing that loot really asks you is like be aware you don't want to play loot and play only creatures because then you're not going to draw many cards but most commander decks are naturally going to be playing a mixture of artifacts enchantments creatures and then you can add in some planeswalkers and battles just to maximize loot but other than that that's all it does. It just like comes down early and draws you a bunch of cards as you play the cards that you're going to play anyway. So loot the key to everything. I am very intrigued to see where this is going. I'm kind of thinking this is going to be like a new Kellen where we're going to see loot kind of going around the multiverse with Jace and Veraska. And there's going to be more to this storyline. So we'll have to wait and see. What do you think? Is loot just like a super cute throwaway character that we get for this one set in Outlaws of Thunder Junction? Or is this the new mascot of magic? Are we actually going to see loot? plushies being for sale from Hasbro in the near future. Very curious what you think of this character. Also, am I missing anything about the card? Because for me, the card, it seems fine. It even seems pretty good. It's got a little protection. It's cheap. It draws a bunch of cards, but it just seems kind of like generic good stuff to me. When I like Legends, I kind of push you in a direction to do something unique rather than just being like, hey, play all the best cards possible, and I'm going to give you even more of them. We also got esoteric duplicator and this card i love for a couple of reasons so it is a two mana artifact clue it's a blue card it says whenever you sack it or another artifact you can pay two if you do at the beginning of the next end step create a token that's a copy of it and then you can pay two sack it to draw a card and then of course you can pay two more to get it back in token form on your next end step so the reason i'm so hyped about this card is wizards unleashed on magic arena for the first time ever mind slaver without laws of thunder junction and i've been trying to figure out how am i going to teach arena zoomers about mind slaver so mind slaver like getting someone with it once it's fine it's pretty devastating but the full dream is to Mind Slaver to lock someone where you just control all of your opponent's turns by looping it. In modern, you can do this with Academy Ruins, but unfortunately, we don't have Academy Ruins on Magic Arena. So I was really scrambling to try to find a realistic way to Mind Slaver lock someone. An Esoteric Duplicator is like, the best option I think now on Arena, you just play this when you sack your Mind Slaver to control your opponent's next turn. You just pay two, and then on your end step, you're going to get another Mind Slaver. So then you can activate it again and control your opponent's next turn and just keep doing this forever. Because notice it doesn't say non token artifact, which means if you sack your token Mind Slaver, you can still pay the two and get another copy of it. So you just kind of control your opponent for the rest of the game. There's also a really devastating combo with Ugin's Nexus. Ugin's Nexus, this five mana legendary artifact that has some text about like making people skip their turns. But the big deal is if it would go to the graveyard from the battlefield, instead you exile it and you take an extra turn after this one. So Esoteric Duplicator plus Ugin's Nexus is just infinite turns. You sacrifice the Ugin's Nexus to the Duplicator, you get an extra turn. Sure, Ugin's Nexus is going to go to exile, but you don't really care. You still sacked it, so you can still pay two to Duplicator to get another one. And then during the extra turn, you do it again, sack it, pay the two, get another Nexus. You take all the turns. It's essentially just a win, and this can happen pretty quickly in a game of Commander. I don't think this is actually good enough for, like, Modern, although it is kind of a two-card infinite win combo. In Artifact decks, if you add in, like, Urza and so forth, there are a lot of ways to tutor up artifacts there's ways to make a ton of mana with artifacts so it seems like it could be at least competitive enough to try to build like an infinite turn deck with ugin's nexus and duplicator in modern or pioneer as far as standard is concerned I'm not really sure exactly what we do with this card. There's not a lot of decks that are about sacking artifacts. I guess Oni Called Anvils kind of is. We have all these goblins that are about sacking artifacts, but I've never really seen anyone put them together into a functional deck. Uh, it does work really well with like doubling seasons, anointed processions. The token copies you make would trigger these. So you sack your thing and pay the two and get two of them instead of one. There's also a bunch of other cards from Big Score itself that just happen to care about artifacts being sacrificed 
artifacts or token copies of artifacts like world waker's helm for two mana you tap it and create a token that's a copy of an artifact token you control that's really powerful two mana to make a copy of an artifact is really strong the challenge is you got to get a token copy of that artifact first but esoteric duplicator is a really easy way to make a token copy of whatever artifact you want or like simulacrum synthesizer just cares about artifacts entering the battlefield so you can be sacking them having a etb legion extruder transmutation font also artifact sack cards so maybe there's some sort of new deck in standard that just mashes together a bunch of these weird artifact sack cards from the big score itself this also does some serious work with carrot clan ironworks so this is banned in modern so it'd probably be more of like a commander deck thing but carrot clan ironworks let's just hack an artifact to add two mana to your mana pool which just so happens to be the exact amount you need to pay to make a token copy of that artifact on your end step so you get down kci and you like sack an icker wellspring you draw a card you use the mana you made to pay the two and then you get back your icker wellspring on your end step you get to draw another card same with like chromatic sphere or whatever so i can imagine some really devastating loop deck with kci and esoteric duplicator popping off this also seems like a really good card for any sort of like artifact token copy or artifact sack commander deck so like Sahili, really good at making token copies of artifacts and then you get to sack them on your end step which will be sacrificing an artifact so you can pay two to get another copy of it or like ashna the uncaring all about sacking artifacts brea all about sacking artifacts so in a deck where you're sacking artifacts anyway i think this is actually a very very strong effect you just have this sit out and you can pay two mana to get your things back once you sack them in token form which is really good so Esoteric Duplicator, I think this card's actually a pretty sweet option. I don't know if it's going to break standard, but I'm super hyped to do some Mind Slaver locking with this card in Timeless on Magic Arena, and I could see it showing up in a lot of Commander decks. It's a really unique and super interesting and powerful effect. We also got Substitute Synthesizer, which seems like a pretty strong artifact. So three mana is a blue card. It's an artifact. When ATBs you scry to, most importantly, whenever another artifact with mana value three or more enters the battlefield under your control, create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. So the big payoff here is it makes Karnstruck. So going back to Karn Cyanivers, so the first card to make these, but made famous by Urza Saga. And now in standard, we have thousands Moonsmithy. And we found that these artifact tokens are really strong. They just get so big, so quick in an artifact deck. In substitute synthesizer, for just three mana sits on the battlefield after scrying two and every time you cast an artifact with mana value three or greater is just gonna make a karn struck so in a deck that's playing a bunch of artifacts this can get out of hand really really quickly i do have a little concern about the mana value restriction we saw this on jenga taxius jenga taxius when you cast nine creatures spell draw a card but only if its mana value is three or greater and it just makes it really hard to kind of go off with jenga taxius because how many three mana value greater spells can you cast in a turn so some Substitute Synthesizer has that same restriction, but I think it's a far more powerful card. So it, essentially the mana value restriction cuts off like really popping off with a Mishra's Bobbles and Mem Knights, like really cheap artifacts. We could just play this and dump your hand of free artifacts and make a huge amount of constructs, which would be pretty busted. But think about standard. We already have decks in standard built around artifacts and that's not including all these new big score artifacts, but like the blue white artifact deck, it's already playing in Thousand Moon Smithy to make Karnstrucks. You got Unstable Glyph Courage, Braided Net, Transbiter, Steel Seraph, Chimmel. Most of that deck is naturally three or more mana. So you just play your synthesizer and everything you do is gonna come along essentially with a kicker of making a Karnstruck, which is really, really powerful. So I think blue white artifacts in standard get way better. We also played this super janky, like Nahiri's Resolve to blink for Mirrodin equipment deck. I think substitute synthesizer could be really good there too, because remember, it doesn't say when you cast an artifact, it's when an artifact of mana value of three or greater enters the battlefield. So so that means you could get this set up, get down your Nahiri Zeus out with some of these four Mirrodin equipment, blink them each turn, and every time they come into play, you're going to make a bunch of Karnstrucks, one for each equipment that you blink. It also seems really good in Affinity style decks. We'll see if this is actually enough to make it in Modern. Three mana is kind of a lot. Maybe it's just too slow for Modern. But in theory, you get this down and you cast your Affinity stuff like Mirror Enforcer, Sojourner's Companion, Thought Monitor, which technically has a mana value of seven, but you're often casting for free or 
power for one mana and you just make a ton of constructs and end up winning the game that way so substitute synthesizer really good for artifact decks i think this card has a lot of potential and we didn't even get into commander but if you're playing a commander deck where you're often casting expensive artifacts which if you're an artifact deck you're probably doing that all the time this seems like a really easy addition to get more value out of your cards we also got legion foundry a shocking artifact <laughs> one in a red for an artifact when atbs it deals two damage to any target and then you pay two to have it sack another artifact to create a three three golem artifact creature token so if you think about what this is it's essentially an expensive sorcery speed shock that's also an artifact that also lets you sacrifice artifacts for two mana to make three threes which i guess is kind of like transmigrant altar i couldn't find any card that was exactly the same as legion foundry second ability this card at first i was like okay Okay, that seems fine right you get artifact synergies trigger any of your artifact stuff get some damage uh, maybe use it as a sack outlet to make some three threes but then the more i thought about it i was like is this just bone crusher giant like bone crusher giant at home but if you think about it for two mana you get two damage to any target same as bone crusher and then for two mana you start making three threes for bone crusher you get a four three with some upside but you only get one of them legion foundry can be making a three three each turn so if you squint really really hard i can kind of see some bone crusher vibes not to say this card is as good as bone crusher but thinking of it like a bone crusher made me think okay maybe this card is actually better than i thought like the flexibility of being a removal spell early that also kind of curves into this creature engine maybe that that's enough to make this card good so this card seems interesting in like oni called anvil decks where you already want to be sacking artifacts although it is worth mentioning as a sack outlet itself it's kind of medium uh, if you just want to sack a bunch of artifacts something like bart's gonna be way better because you just sack as many as you want for free but if you're an oni called anvil deck and you're more like i'm sacking one thing each turn to trigger all my stuff legion foundry is kind of great there you're getting some damage out of it and you're getting three three artifact creatures that have future synergies with your deck also seems good in like cranko goblins we were talking earlier about how goblins in standard has this weird artifact sack sub theme so this is a card that seems perfect for something like Cranko, it's like a bad removal spell but then you sack it to Cranko and grow your team and make some goblins so maybe this card can actually make Cranko goblins a thing also seems really good in any sort of like artifact sack commander deck if you're playing Ozgear or Doretti in a deck like that I just like this as a little value sack engine can put some bodies on the battlefield and two damage actually kills a surprising amount of things if you need to snipe you know early rain creatures mana dorks esper sentinels this is actually going to get the job done so legion foundry it's not actually bone crusher but it is kind of like bad artifact bone crusher and bad artifact bone crusher might actually be good enough to see some play we also got <laughs> Our favorite cute little friend Loot is back, an Omen's Path Journey. So Omen Path Journey, I've been going back and forth as to whether this is like the most broken ramp spell for Commander ever or it's completely unplayable. Four mana enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for up to five land cards, not basic land cards, any land cards. They have different names, exile them, and then shuffle. And then at the beginning of your end step, you get to put one of those cards at random into play tapped. So Omen Pass Dirty, if you think about this, this is non-basic land ramp which is actually incredibly powerful in commander lands keep getting stronger and stronger and being able to find non-basics with ramp is kind of huge and if you think about it four mana is kind of the going right we just got arch druid's charm arch druid's charm though is triple green which is kind of a cost in a lot of decks but like peers whim grabs you a non-basic land for four mana with a bunch of upsides temp with discovery has some upside if your opponents play greedily you can get multiple lands out of it but gets a non-basic for four mana so omen path journey this has this huge upside of if things go well this can ramp your five best non-basic lands from your library onto the battlefield and if you think about commander there's so many busted lands field of the dead maze of Ist, glacial chasm dark depths thespian sage vesuva strip mine cabal coffers nick those guys cradle sarah saint and the list is super super long so pretty much any commander deck that you're playing should have five really good targets to get with this so what's the problem why am i not super hyped and saying this is the most broken card of all time well the problem is let's say you play your omen path journey and you snake field of the dead maze of Ist, vesuva thespian sage strip mine your five best non-basic lands and you're like this is going to be awesome i'm gonna feel the dead you're not gonna kill me because i got maze of it i'm gonna copy a bunch of stuff i'm gonna strip mine you it's gonna be great the problem is 
all these cards are going to be face up. So your opponent's going to know what cards that you tutored. And they're going to be like, hmm, those cards are pretty scary. And if they blow up Omen Pass Journey, all those cards remain in exile forever. So the risk is you use this to tutor up your five best non-basic lands and someone disenchants it and you lose your five best non-basic lands forever. So the ceiling of this card is ridiculously high. I truly believe the ceiling of this card is best ramp spell in commander or at least on the short list of best ramp spells in commander. When you play this and it sticks out for five turns and you get your five best lands over those turns, this card is legit busted, probably gonna win of the game on the other hand there will be times when you cast this get your five best lands someone blows it up and you are really really sad because you don't have access to those cards for the rest of the game so the floor is also really really low it's going to be interesting to see how people play this card if they do play this card one way to kind of mitigate the damage is maybe you don't search for five lands it does say up to five lands so you can always search for one land and just always get that non-basic land on your end step you could search for like two lands and hope it sticks around for a couple of turns before you know the farewell happens or whatever so it's gonna be very interesting i am super curious what you all think of this card i will say i think it goes up even more in value in enchantment decks so even if you're not hyped about it in a generic deck this is a ramp spell that triggers your sethis or works with your estrid or triggers your tetsuba so i think that's intriguing for enchantress decks at a minimum but i'm very curious let me know what you think is this card like absolutely busted one of the best ramp spells in commander or is this card just kind of like bad and like you shouldn't even play it because the risk is too high let me know what you think in the comments next up in big score we have pest control in this card one of the best i think eternal format cards from big score maybe from the set altogether so a white and a black mana for a sorcery this is destroy all non-land permanents with mana value one or less and as a bonus it cycles for two, which is probably a little shout out to Magic Arena. Like in best of one, it would be hard to put this card in your deck, even if you wanted it, because yeah, it's gonna be great against aggro, but if you're under control, it's a dead card. But having cycling makes it a lot easier to play this card, especially in best of one formats, because worst case, if it's a dead card, you just cycle it away for two mana and find something else. So this card is essentially the first mode of Hitasugu Consumes All, but instead of all the soggy upside flip into a creature stuff, it's cheaper, and you have the cycling upside. And I think this card will see play from standard all the way back to modern for sure, probably even legacy and vintage CDH, uh, even though I'm not an expert on like the vintage meta or whatever, but I think in standard pest control, most obvious application, really, really good against the Boros deck, any sort of aggro deck with a bunch of one drops really, but this snipes all tokens in all one drops. So all the gleeful demolition tokens, the warden of the inner sky, novice inspector, and the clue that it makes, this blows it all up for just two mana, which is kind of incredible. So in best of three we have cards like temporary lockdown which are more flexible probably but more expensive it hits two drops along with one drops but in best of one this is probably just one of the best options i would say if you're struggling to deal with aggro it's also pretty good against like mono red which has a lot of one drops blows up venerated rot priest and a bunch of stuff against the toxic deck pretty hilarious against gold vein hydra it can blow up the gold vein hydra no matter how much mana goes into it because it's always one mana or it can blow up all the tap tokens that it makes once it dies so in standard i think at best this could be a main deck card especially in best of one at worst i think this looks like a sideboard all-star that you can bring in to just absolutely hose the aggro decks and even in that context the cycling's a big upside because sometimes your opponent's gonna have a weird draw or maybe you draw multiples of these and you only need one being able to cycle this away and find some more action is really really big in modern this card is kind of absurd it gets all the urza saga tokens all the crashing footfall tokens blows up ragavan all the one drops and then a bunch of weird like hate cards chalice of the void pithing needle engineered explosives this snipes them all for just two mana so i think this will show up in a lot of modern sideboards the other place i think this card will be really good is not in casual commander i don't think i'd play this in casual commander although it would be pretty funny if i knew someone was playing a token deck just to play that to kind of like blow them out so if i ever know crim's playing a token deck i might throw this in my deck otherwise i think this is more of a cdh style card in cdh everyone's playing all these fast mana rocks right 
mana crypts and mana vaults and soul rings, uh, mystic remoras, all the treasures from dock sides. Pass control gets rid of all of those for just two mana. So if your play group is very high powered and everyone's playing these super fast zero one mana mana rocks, then I think pass control is a really good option for your commander deck. If you're playing more like commander clash power level where we have the fast mana spells banned, I probably wouldn't play this. Like I said, it is really good against token decks, but otherwise I don't think I would play this in a commander clash game because we just don't play those super efficient fast mana rocks. But if you do play those, then this card's a really nice answer. So pass control, one of the best constructed cards I think from the set, really good against aggro, eternal implications, and some high powered commander implications. We also got memory vessel which boy this card is bad five mana artifact you can tap it to exile memory vessel each player exiles the top seven cards of their library until your next turn players may play cards they exiled this way and they can't play cards from their hand activate only as a sorcery so if this card looks familiar it is designed after one of the most infamously broken cards in the game's history in memory jar memory jar Five mana, sack it. Each player sets aside their hand face down, draw seven cards, and at the end of the turn, you discard all the cards you drew with Memory Jar and get your hand back, essentially. So why is Memory Vessel so bad and Memory Jar was so broken? There's a few different reasons. The biggest one, though, is that Memory Jar, the way it works is you sack Memory Jar during your turn. Your opponent's going to draw seven cards, but it's during your turn. Your opponent's probably tapped out. Even if they're not tapped out, they can only cast instants. So your opponent's not really going to get use out of the cards because they're going to discard all those cards on your end step. The issue with Memory Jar is you crack this Memory Jar during your turn, which you have to because it's only a sorcery. Everyone's going to get this new seven card exile hand from Memory vessel and it lasts until your next turn so sure you crack this and you get to play your cards but then your next opponent gets to play with their new seven card hand and the next one and the next one so memory jar was pretty much only beneficial to you a huge percentage of the time when memory vessel is going to benefit the whole table pretty much every time so i think this card is just not going to be good enough there's also like the downside memory jar makes you draw the easiest way to kill people with old memory jar combo decks actually involve drawing and discarding cards things like megram to burn your opponent out of the game that's not really going to work with memory vessel because the cards are being impulse drawn rather than real drawn so you can't really combo this with like shield raider orcish bowmasters like you could with memory jar so all around this card just feels super super safe which is good we don't want another memory jar if you're going to make a memory jar you better go safe with it and make sure it doesn't break everything so what could we possibly do with this card in standard we do have a few cards that care about playing things from exile like quintorius on. Whenever you cast a spell from exile, you drain for two. Or PNLR. Whenever you cast a spell from exile, you make a 1-1 one, one hasty thopter token. So maybe a deck like this could take advantage of it. Even there, I'm honestly not sure I'd play Memory Jar, but those are the kind of synergies that could make it work. And the same is true of Commander, like Good and Prosper. I know the most abused phrase in Magic for the last few years, but any Commander that cares about casting stuff from Exile, Rocco, Faldron, any of those Commanders, I would at least consider it. Although honestly, it's probably not gonna make the cut. The only Commander where I feel confident I would want this card in my deck is actually Rocco Street Chef. Just because Rocco triggers off of opponents playing stuff from Exile is well so if you're playing a Rocco deck you're kind of like signing up for your opponents casting stuff from exile you want that to happen because that's how you trigger your Rocco so in a Rocco deck the fact that your opponents can have this hand from exile to play I think that's fine but I don't think I'd play it in Prosper or Feldorn even though you could get value out of it so that's Memory Vessel cool to see a new take on a super busted old card and I guess I'm glad that Watsy went conservative with it because you really don't want to risk making another memory jar which just straight up broke the game we also got world walkers helm so three mana blue artifact it says if you would create one or more artifact tokens instead create those tokens plus a map token and then you can pay one into blue to create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control so we talked about this earlier actually the last mode on this card is a real exciting one the first mode it is cute and i do like these effects like peregrine truck chatterfang queen analia whenever you make tokens you get a little bonus token i think a map token is probably the least powerful of the tokens that you make with these effects but still it's a little extra value if you're trying to flood the board with artifacts for some reason doing like lana shenanigans or whatever this is going to add a lot of these trinkety map artifact tokens to the battlefield so if you have a way to take advantage of that then this is a good card just for his first mode maybe you're trying to like do a 
infinity things and just getting an extra map every time you make a token is good enough for your deck or maybe you're trying to power up constructs uh, just having the extra artifacts on the battlefield gonna be really powerful i think the most intriguing part of this card though is that last mode two mana create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control that effect is really efficient and really powerful the only problem is it's not that easy to get a strong artifact token on the battlefield sure you can pay to and copy a map or a treasure or something that's not very impactful or efficient but you really want some big bad artifact like a artifact token portal of Frexy on the battlefield so how do you actually get that in standard we got some of the stuff we've talked about from big score otherwise like c uh, Double replication specialist Dow House of Fours is kind of cute. You can exile creatures from a graveyard and get small constructy artifact versions of them. So these cards can give you copies of more powerful artifacts in token form that then you can copy with world waker's helm so maybe there's some sort of deck doing that we've also seen like transmutation font another one of the big score cards that just wants artifact tokens with different names on the battlefield and it taps to make bloods and clues and foods and then you tutor out your best artifact it seems really good there where you make a blood token but get a map token too so you have two differently named tokens almost getting you to an activation of transmutation font so i think those are the kind of synergies you're looking for and I think the same thing's mostly true in Commander. I don't think I would play this just in a token deck to be like, all right, when I make a token, I also get a map. Plus, especially, it has to be artifact tokens. So keep that in mind as well. Like, it's specifically artifact tokens, uh, but in a deck that's built around artifact tokens, like Bernard, for example, Burdiclad, Gimbal, Mishra Eminent one, then I think this card is very strong. Not only are you making artifact tokens, so you're gonna get some bonus maps for free, but these commanders are pretty good at making token copies of other artifacts. So you can get like your Bernard weird food golems and then make token copies of your best one. Mishra can make token copies of any of your non-creature artifacts. So you use Mishra to turn them into tokens and then World Waker's Helm to copy the tokens. Uh, so there's a lot of synergies with specific commanders. So World Waker's Helm. It's a fun card, I really like it, but it does have pretty strict requirements, right? You need to be making artifact tokens and preferably big copies of artifacts as tokens for that last ability. So it's gonna be hard to really embrace its power, but if you can, the reward of that last mode is actually pretty high. We also got a new Lotus in Lotus Ring. So Lotus Ring, three to cast, three to equip. It's an indestructible equipment. It says equip creature gets plus three, plus three, has vigilance and tap, sack this creature, add three mana of any color. So essentially for the low, low price of six mana, kind of three to cast, three to equip, you can turn any creature into a black Lotus, which is the Lotus Ring. You put on the Lotus Ring, sack yourself, make some mana. So this card, ah, I don't think it's really that strong. If this card's gonna work, I think you really need a way to cheat on the equip cost. So three to cast isn't a deal breaker. The big problem is if you think about this card, it's three to equip and it only makes three mana. So if you just put this on a creature and sack it, you kind of really did nothing. You spent three to make three. I guess it could fix your mana or you could put this on a creature and save up mana for the next turn and use it like a weird ramp spell. But I think this is probably gonna be at its best in cards that let you equip for free or cheat on equip cost. So like pure Steel Paladin just lets you equip for free with Metalcraft. Blainer Battlehammer lets you equip for free. Sir Gwyn lets you equip to knights for free. In a deck that can equip for free, this card can do some pretty scary things where you just like make a big board and keep moving the Lotus Ring around and sacking random tokens or whatever to make a huge amount of mana all in one turn. I think there is one combo I've seen. There's probably some other combos that are like five piece combos, but the simplest combo is Cole the Forge Master in Fervent Champion. So Fervent Champion, really good with Lotus Ring because it lets you pay three less for equip costs on it. So essentially you can equip Lotus Ring to it for free and it has haste too, which is also relevant since the creature needs to tap to sack itself to make the mana. And then Cole just says, when a non-token creature you control died, if it was equipped or enchanted, return it to your hand. So essentially you put Fervent Champion on the battlefield, you put Lotus Ring on it for free thanks to its ability. Then you sack it to make three mana and then Cole's gonna let you return the Fervent Champion back to your hand. You can cast it for one mana, 
re-equip for free, sack it for three mana, recast it for one, sack it for three, recast it for one. So essentially this combo just gives you infinite mana. So if you're playing a coal commander deck, I would certainly keep this in mind. The other upside of this card is it is just a free sack outlet. Like maybe we're going too deep and thinking this is a combo piece. Maybe this is actually just like a woe strider and you like put this on a creature, <laughs> you tap it, you sack it, you make three mana, you use a three mana to move it over to the next creature. Then you tap it, you sack it, you make three mana. It is a little annoying that your creatures can't be summoning sick to do this. So it is a drawback compared to like a woe strider, which can just sack anything. But this could be relevant in some sort of equipment based aristocrat deck, which I don't even know if that's an archetype that exists. I'm not even sure I've ever seen a real equipment aristocrat deck, but the upside in some sort of aristocrat equipment deck is you can find this with your equipment tutor. So you get like Stoneforge Mystic and Lighten Tutor. So if you're an aristocrat deck that is also playing these tutor packages, then I think this is a nice backup sack outlet. So it could show up in like Tisa Karlov, LSL Core, Carmen, Alenda, assuming you have this equipment sub theme. On the other hand, if you don't have an equipment sub theme, you might as well just like Frexian Altar, Ashnod's Altar. Like you can just tutor these up and they're way easier to go infinite with. Your creatures can be summoning sick and they still work. So Lotus Ring, it's a really interesting card. I really like this card. It's like a cool callback flavorful design. My guess is... It's not very good in general, but that it does have combos it can enable, but you're gonna need a lot of cards and a lot of work to actually pull them off. We also got two big reprints in Big Score, Rest in Peace and Grand Abolisher. So Rest in Peace, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, coming to Standard for the first time in a minute, already in all the other formats, and this card will certainly serve a purpose in Standard. Uh, we've seen some graveyard decks really rise in Standard. For the last couple months, I've been saying, put graveyard heat in your sideboards, please play graveyard heat in standard because of like the aftermath analysts landfall combos from the graveyard reenact the crime conspiracy and raveler combos so rest in peace seems like a sideboard all-star it is one of the best graveyard hate spells that has ever been made in magic the hardest form of graveyard hate in existence so if you really want to make sure your opponent's not going to pop off with aftermath analysis or combo off with reenact the crime this is a great sideboard card to get that job done as far as grand abolisher this card, oh, we'll see. We'll see how good it is in standard. So it's a two mana two two. It is double white. And it just makes it so during your turn, your opponent essentially can't do anything. So if you're a white aggro player and you're annoyed that your opponent keeps countering your things, your control opponent, Grand Abolisher just says no, essentially. During my turn, you're not going to counter my stuff. You're not going to kill my thing during combat. I get to do my thing. I get to make sure I can do whatever I want. And you're not going to be able to interact with me. And that's a pretty powerful effect. I don't know if it'll really be good enough in standard. Maybe as a sideboard card. It really depends on the meta. The most common use of this, though, is to protect your own combo. So you could play it as like a beater in some sort of white aggro deck, but mostly this is used like a weird silence effect where you're trying to like combo off with Lotus Field or maybe in Timeless, you want to do the show and tell Omniscience big combo turn. Uh, maybe you're trying to do some Necropone Storming in Timeless. If you can get down a Grand Abolisher, you know that you can execute your combo and your opponent's not going to be able to interact with it you don't have to worry that they're going to counter something kill something do anything to ruin your plans because grand abolisher just says no you are not going to be able to interact with me this turn so this is new to magic arena has never been in timeless or historic also new to pioneer so those are the formats where i think this card could make an impact it's already in modern doesn't really see modern play it does see some like cdh play for the same purpose like i play my grand abolisher combo off win the game so i think it could serve a purpose in timeless maybe in Pioneer, and I think it's worth keeping in mind for Standard. Otherwise, it's a solid, like, $10 reprint or something, so not a bad card to open in your booster pack. We also got the rest of the Big Score bonus sheet. So Big Score is a reminder. Uh, this is, like, Brothers War Retro Artifacts or Strixhaven Mystical Archives. It's just a special slot. You get one in each pack. They're all reprints. Legality doesn't change or anything outside of Magic Arena, and that's going to be our big focus today. So like yesterday, the cards are broken down by, are they new to arena and can they see play in timeless or historic on arena so all these cards here 
they're just reprints they're already all on magic arena so nothing really changes there it is a little funny to see standard cards already getting reprinted like unlicensed turfs or buried in the garden but i expect we're gonna see more of this now that we're in three years standard then we have a couple of cards that are new to arena but i don't think really do anything the first card is decimate for four mana you blow up an artifact and enchantment a creature in a land the problem with decimate it reads like a ridiculous card right it reads like uh, casualties of war almost but for four mana the problem is it's not an up two card so there has to be an artifact and a creature in a champion to land on the battlefield it sees a bit of commander play but it's just too risky to play in 60 card formats and i think it's probably even too risky to play in brawl just because a lot of opponents aren't going to have all four of those types on the battlefield most decks well every deck's going to have a land right uh, most decks will have a creature some decks will have an artifact enchantment's probably the sketchiest one uh, but the odds of your opponent having all four of those is not super high so a lot of times this card just gets stuck in your hand the other card tornado I actually forgot existed I guess it could be a sideboard card for some like cycling deck that needs to deal with a flyer but really I don't think it really matters then we have four cards that are new to arena and super relevant for timeless and historic one of the big ones and the best reprint in this entire set mind break trap mind break trap like 80 bucks because it's one of the best storm hate cards in all the magic sees a lot of play in legacy and vintage and I think this card can have an impact on timeless so it's four mana to exile any number of target spells but if your opponent cast at least three spells you can cast it for zero mana so this card is essentially like the greatest storm hoser in magic so if you're worried about losing to storm this is a great sideboard card i was trying to figure out if it worked against show and tell and i don't think it really does like yes if your opponent combos with show and tell they're gonna what show and tell omniscient start casting a bunch of spells eventually you'll be able to exile a spell for free and maybe if you can get like the exact right spell it can matter but it's not like the Omni Tell decks are going to have this huge stack of spells to exile like Storm. So I think probably just a sideboard card to deal with Storm decks. Card number two, Surgical Extraction. I'm really excited about this one for two reasons. So first, it's just a really good hate card. Uh, being able to like get a combo piece of your opponents in the graveyard and then exile all the copies of it for two life and zero mana thanks to its Fraxian cost is really, really strong. So it's a good graveyard hate card. It's a good combo hate card. The other thing this card does is I think alongside Archive Trap, which we saw yesterday, it might actually make Timeless Mill into a real thing. Because the risk with Mill, of course, is you mill things into your graveyard that your opponent wants in their graveyard and it ends up hurting you. But Surgical Extraction in a mill deck kind of solves that problem. If you mill something recursive or whatever, you can just exile it, get rid of all the copies of it, and it might actually let the deck be able to beat something like Show and Tell. Because against Show and Tell, imagine your opponent like cracks their turn one fetch, you archive trap them for free, mill 13 cards if you can hit the omniscience or hit the show and tell you can just extract all the copies of it and take your opponent's primary game plan off the table so i think surgical extraction a huge huge deal again probably a sideboard card outside of mill but still a really good option for the format then we have force of vigor force of vigor one of the best cards in modern in legacy really good at blowing up artifacts and enchantments uh, it's one of the force cycles so you can cast it for free by exiling a green card from your hand blows up two artifacts and enchantments the card's pretty valuable and it's just like an all-star sideboard card so if you need to deal with an artifact or an enchantment often sees play in combo decks or like graveyard decks uh one of the classic things i think of is like dredge dredge for example you need your graveyard active your opponent's gonna bring in things like rest in peace or leyline of the void to shut down your graveyard this is a free way that you can blow up the graveyard hate spell and then combo off and win the game so i think force of vigor will see a ton of sideboard play the last card abrupt decay abrupt decay certainly has uses right blows up something mana value three or less uh, not counting lands but it's uncounterable so it gets around wards and so forth and timeless has a pretty efficient format like a lot of the permanent scene play discounting like show and tell and all you know those that style of deck but most of the permanent scene play are going to be mana value three or less so i think this card can definitely serve a purpose especially if you're worried about counter spells finally we got overwhelming forces which i wanted to shout out just because this is a card that looks really expensive like uh, it's a portal three kingdoms card so the portal three kingdoms version is like 
$30 or something just because they printed like no Portal 3 Kingdom pretty much. It was only printed for the Asian market and that was 20 years ago. So just not many copies of this card is in existence. Uh, so it's like a $130 card, but now thanks to this reprinting, it's probably gonna be like five bucks or maybe even less than five bucks. It's eight mana to blow up all creatures target opponent controls. And you get to draw a card for each creature destroyed this way, which actually isn't a bad brawl card. It's kind of like a plague win style effect in a 1v1 commander format like brawl. Too expensive to see any 60 card format play though, but I mostly want to mention it just because if you see that like $130 price tag or whatever, uh, don't take it seriously. This version is going to be way, 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 way less expensive because no one actually plays the card. It's just expensive because it's scarce. Finally today, a couple of other main set cards that uh, one was the very last main set card that got spoiled that we haven't talked about. And one is a card that chat pointed out during the stream today that I missed earlier this week. So last card of the main set, Dust Animus, a two mana two three spirit with flying. And it says, if you control five or more untapped lands, it enters a battlefield with two plus one plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it. And you can plot it for two. And I will say, this card is kind of ridiculous. If there is one theme of the main set of Outlaws of Thunder Junction, it is power creeping two drop. So I did a little research on this one. The only two mana two three flyer in white that has ever existed without a huge drawback is Tomic. And even Tomic is double white and legendary, which you could argue is a drawback. So Dust Animus, just by its base stats, just as a two mana two three flyer, that's already kind of an example of power creep. And this is so much more than that because you can plot this for two mana and wait until you get five lands on the battlefield and then cast this as a four five flying life linker for two mana, which is kind of insane. That's like a six mana value creature, like an exalted angel or a Valkyrie Harbinger for just two mana. Yeah, there's a timing restriction where you gotta wait to get enough lands, but this card seems really good to me. The only question I have for this card is, where do I play it? I guess it's probably good enough that you could just play it in any generic white aggro deck. Like it's a two mana two, three flyer. That's kind of a split card that can come down later in the game is an even bigger, more lifelinking flyer. So I don't know if it makes it in like Boros aggro or whatever, but this card, it's going to be in standard for nearly three years. I'm sure there will be white aggro decks, white X aggro decks. that want to take advantage of this. It's just a fast flying above the curve, efficient threat with upside. Thanks to the plot ability. It's also a spirit. So I don't think being a spirit, it matters a ton in standard. We don't have a ton of payoffs for that. I guess Katilda technically cares about spirits. Geist Late Snare cares about a spirit, but this might matter in older formats. I don't know if this is going to be good enough for like pioneer spirits. There's just so many other options already, but it is a spirit. So your Supreme Phantom will pump it. You can flash it in with rattle chains. I was just looking through like a pioneer spirits deck list and I think Dust Animus is good. I just couldn't figure out what I cut for it because all the other spirits have some sort of ability. They're pumping spirits or letting you flash them in or countering stuff and dust animus while it is like a big beater that can be a big life linking beater it's kind of still just a beater it doesn't have any like super sneaky shenanigans so i don't know maybe you could play it in the sideboard to, for like aggro is it fast enough if it's coming down on turn five with life link against aggro maybe it's not so maybe it has a chance in pioneer spirits but uh, we'll have to wait and see but i am pretty confident it's a power creepy and very good standard card finally we have high noon so high noon's a card that actually got spoiled like a week ago and i thought we talked about it we go through so many spoilers during these spoiler videos i thought we talked about it but chat today during our twitch stream pointed out that i hadn't so i decided i'd add it in it's a two minute wait enchantment it says each player can't cast more than one spell each turn and you can pay four in a red sack it to deal five damage to any target so this is essentially a very upgraded rule of law which means it's competing with like archon of amiria which is kind of the creature version of this effect deafening silence even cheaper but only cares about non-creature spells so i think high noon this is a card that can serve a purpose whether it beats out the other options that remains to be seen what is the purpose of high noon and it's mostly to hate on decks that are trying to play multiple spells a turn so most obviously any sort of like storm combo deck is going to really struggle with high noon because i got to cast a bunch of spells in a turn arc light phoenix can't cast three spells to get back their phoenixes because they can only cast one spell also like smaller examples it stops cascade you cast a cascade spell you can't cast what you cascade into same with discover so this does hit on a lot although there is a drawback here it is symmetrical so remember you are also going to be locked in to only casting one spell each turn i think as far as standard is concerned 
It seems good against combo decks, like Reenact the Crime combo that wants to cast a bunch of spells in a turn. Although Reenact the Crime could also just like reanimate a Troxa and try to beat you down with it rather than comboing. It seems like if you're on the play and can get this down fast enough, it could really annoy like Boros. Boros really wants to be playing two or three cards a turn, dumping their hand really fast. So maybe there could be some implications here. I do like that Wizards added the removal mode to this card for two purposes. So one is... Uh, best one play is uh, again another example of like this isn't an effect you could really put in your best of one deck even if you wanted it in certain matchups because it would be dead in a lot of matchups but having some removal build in makes it a little bit more palatable to have in your best of one deck more importantly this is a way that you can break out from under the high noon if you want to you can always sacrifice it to get that five damage and get it off the battlefield so then you can start casting multiple spells a turn so one of the upsides of this card is you can lock your opponent under one spell a turn wait till their end step pop the damage mode and then during your turn combo off cast all your spells go on to win the game so that is a really really huge upside there even if it's five mana i think this card could have some ramifications in pioneer where it shuts down quintorius combo really well we have deafening silence in pioneer but deafening silence only cares about non-creature spells so you can play quintorius and activate it and keep casting the spark doubles and so forth and deafening silence won't stop it but high noon will so i could see this being a good sideboard card in pioneer Pioneer, also good against like Lotus Field style combos in Pioneer. So I think that's probably the primary home. In Timeless, I think it could also be pretty good. In Timeless, we have like Necropotent Storm. We have Show and Tell Omni Tell decks that are going off with Omniscience to cast a huge amount of spells in a turn. Again, it's not going to stop your opponent from being like Show and Tell Atroxa, beat you down with it, but it is going to stop your opponent from having that huge combo turn. So I could see it being a pretty good sideboard card in Timeless. The real question is, how does it rank against the other options it's competing with? And I would say it's clearly better than Rule of Law. If you were playing Rule of Law, you play High Noon instead. It's just rule of law that's one less mana, and you might be able to get some damage out of it sometimes. As far as the other two options, I think our kind of Amiria might still be the best of the bunch but it is three mana so if you really need to be as fast as possible and just get this effect down as quickly as possible you probably go with high noon but our kind of amiria does have the upside of dealing damage by attacking although it's also a creature that can die to removal i think it's actually very close probably what it really comes down to is does my deck care about creatures if i'm playing collecting company and court of calling and effects like that then our kind of amiria goes up in value and high noon goes down if i don't have any of that stuff then high noon might be better and then deafening silence it's just not exactly the same right in some matchups it's just a better option against like storm for example deafening silence is essentially just one mana high noon the other thing to mention about deafening silence is if you're a creature deck you can kind of play it for free because it only taxes non-creature spells so you can still cast multiple creatures in a turn or one non-creature and multiple creatures in a turn while your opponent's spell slinger deck isn't going to be able to do much of anything because they're trying to play only non-creature spells so i think deafening silence can be the best but again it comes down to the matchup it comes down to your deck construction so all things considered high noon is maybe just the best of this effect i still think we're gonna see deafening silence c play in certain decks for certain matchups we're gonna see archon of amiria c play in certain decks for certain matchups but high noon is just like the new cheapest rule law effect so if you want to make sure your opponent's not going to cast a bunch of spells in a turn and you can build your deck in a way that you don't get totally crushed by only casting one spell each turn i'm sure it's going to be annoying and there's going to be times when you want to cast multiple spells but you can't but if you can do that then i think high noon's actually Actually a pretty good card so anyway that brings us to the end of our daily outlaws of thunder junction and i guess daily big score really spoilers for today so let me know what you think about all these ridiculous cards thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it oh yeah one other thing so this might be our last spoiler video i'll see there might be big uh, more big score cards still coming out tomorrow if there's more cards i'll definitely do a video on them but i did want to give you the heads up that thursday is coming commander precon day and tomer's going to be covering those over on the empty jewelfish commander youtube so if you want to see all the new commander decks broken down when they come out make sure to mosey on over to the empty jewelfish commander youtube on thursday and friday so anyway everyone thanks again for watching i hope you have an amazing day and i will talk to you soon looking for even more magic well you can check out yesterday's spoiler video here or maybe last night's much brew where we killed our opponent just by drawing cards